Um, the settings that we use for um, camera control. Um, for exposure one, um, all this information is up on the ID file website, but I figured I'd share what we're using. Um, so with our camera set up, we typically use aperture priority uh, rather than the manual setting. Um, so in that case, we just set the aperture to F16, which we found works the best. Um, if you go up above 16, the, the images weren't quite the quality we wanted and below. It was different. I'm not sure why. You would think that above that, you'd get more depth of field, but for some reason, F16 really worked the best. Um, and then we would, we would change the exposure compensation as we went along. So if we um, went to the live view and saw that um, the photograph looked a little darker after we'd taken it, it looked a little dark, we just uh, compensate for that by moving the, the arrow over to the side of it. Um, and then on the next section, uh, set the ISO to 200, which is as low as it can go for the camera we were using. And then with the, the white balance, um, we played around with that, trying to find the, the best balance that represented the, the specimens the best. Uh, we settled on fluorescent white balance with the sodium with sodium vapor lamps. And then as far as uh, storage, we started out doing JPEGs and RAW files, and then quickly realized that that was a waste of time as far as photographing and also server space because we weren't using the JPEGs at all. We only were using the, the raw data. Uh, so here's a, a view of the live shot um, from, from camera control. And when we set up the shot, we want to maximize the size of the specimen in the, uh, in the viewing window. But you don't want to get too close to the edges. Um, the closer you get to the edges, the more likely you're going to get um, some distortion with it. So we would leave a little bit of space um, on either edge and top and bottom. And then I would move the, uh, sort of the, the focal window there. Um, if you move this on the specimen, it'll focus on the specimen. You can do the, the autofocus. Um, but because we're doing manual focus, what we found um, when this was on the specimen, as you would photograph um, through your stack, the, um, the light balance would sort of change along the way. So you'd get one, one photo that was a little bit darker than the next one, and then the next one might be a little bit lighter. And to adjust for that, we just move that to a neutral area on the in the window, and that kept them all consistent all the way throughout. So then what we would do is use um, the manual focus adjust here, um, usually setting it in the middle, and then uh, focus on the very back portion of the fish, so usually a pelvic fin or um, the caudal fin if it was against the, the back of the glass. Um, and we would start at the back and basically just adjust this either uh, so that hit this arrow once and it would slowly sort of incrementally break forward. And each time we hit that, we would take another photograph. Um, and then it would end once we got to about the pectoral fin or the caudal fin if that was against the glass. So you get a range of, of um, different ranges of different focal levels. Um, and then we took those images and imported them into a telecom focus light. Um, this is very easy, you just kind of drag and drop them into this window. Um, the main key here is that when you put your images in, sometimes they come in out of order, and if you try to stack it out of order, you get these really weird effects. Um, so to adjust for that, there's this little button up here, you just hit that once or twice to make sure that they're in the right order. Making sure that your first image with the lowest number is the first one. The reason that we focus on the, on the back of the specimen before the front is when these are compiled, it's it's going to set all of the sizing to that first image. So as you're focusing closer to you, the images are going to get a little bit bigger each time. Um, so by focus, so by starting at the back, it's going to shrink your images down to fit that first one rather than enlarging them to fit the next one. So you don't risk losing any resolution that way. And then as we're as we're setting this up. Um, what I'll do is go to the first image, uh, zoom in really close on an area that I know is going to be in focus in that, that first image, so something that's the farthest away from me. Um, zooming in and then going to the next one. And you can see if we go back and forth, that second photo has better focus. Um, so then I'm just going to trash that, that first one and start with the one with the 55 extension there. 
Then I do the same thing for the other end. Um, this is the second to last. Go to the next one, that's a little bit sharper. This is the dorsal fin here. So this one here is a dorsal view. Um, this shows the, the technique a little bit better. Um, so then I don't need to delete any there. Uh, so then you're ready to render. There's a little button up here, you just click on it, and it starts the montage process. And I'll just step through here. And each time, it's grabbing portions of the photograph that are in focus for that section. And then at the end, it compiles all of that together, and you get this great photo with amazing depth of field. Um, and then saving that, um, we've got a couple of options. We always export a TIFF file, um, and those will export in a 16-bit um, version of that. You can choose no compression or LCW compression. We usually go with the LCW compression just to, to save server space. And then you just save that file. Um, and I'll talk about the, the naming conventions that we use in a minute. Um, so for naming a file, um, we typically try to keep everything consistent throughout. And we start with a genus. And we use underscores instead of spaces. Um, those of you who are in the Mac world, spaces are not a big deal. Um, but the minute that you talk to an IT person um, and they see spaces in your, in your files, they freak out and make you go in and, and put in underscores. So we put underscores in in place of spaces. So um, start with genus, species, um, then the museum identifier, in our case it's ANSP, the catalog number, and then an abbreviation for the view. So D for dorsal, B for ventral, LL for left lateral, RL for right, la right lateral, and so on. Um, and then underneath that there you can see an example of one of, one of our file names. And then for radiographs, I do the exact same thing except that at the end I add an X. Um, because as you can see with those two file names there, the only difference is that X. So if you're importing um, images over and you forget to put them in a new folder, you might overwrite that, that old file and you have to go back and redo that work. Then each of these, all these images, the radiographs and the, um, the photographs are put into another folder. And for this one, um, it's genus species, museum identifier, the catalog number. And because these are types, we're also putting in type status, so H for holotype, S for syntype, L for lectotype, and so on. Um, and then the photographer's initials, um, so that we know who did the photography, and if, the, uh, if they need to be re-photographed or something like that, we know who to go to to, to make that happen. Um, as far as folder contents, we saw a lot of this with Mark, um, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we save everything. Um, we figure it's better to take up a lot of space on the server than to trash something and then find out you really needed it and then have to redo that work. Um, we have the benefit of having servers with a good amount of storage, so this isn't an issue for us, but I know for a lot of projects you might run into storage issues. Um, so we save all the raw files from the, the montage images, an, uned an unedited montage image, um, uh, radiograph images with, uh, it's actually a VIV extension, um, that's just the, the file that the software that we use exports initially and then you can export TIFF to, to work on. Um, and then for the edited, edited images, we're saving a 16-bit layer TIFF image with LCW compression instead of layer compression. Um, and in addition to that, an 8-bit layer TIFF with the same compressions. The reason we're saving um, both of those is the 16-bit, you're getting more data. But the 8-bit, you, you can send via email. In most cases, you can usually keep those under 20 megs. Um, so that way, you can send it to a researcher um, in lieu of JPEG, and they can actually see most of the detail there. And then an 18-bit flattened JPEG. Um, the, with the Helicon Focus Lite, you don't have a lot of options. Um, we use it more manually than anything, but if you switch to Helicon Focus Pro, you can utilize um, automatic settings. So basically, what you do is you set a bottom and a top, and, it, and you set the number of increments in between, and it automatically takes those photographs. Um, to do that, though, you need um, an automatic step um, rig uh, called a stack shot um, and, and a shutter cable. Um, the, the other benefit to this is because the uh, Helicon remote is controlling your camera, you don't need Camera Control Pro 2 or Camera Control. Um, and other advantages to, to the Helicon Focus Pro is there's a retouching brush. So as you're um, compressing your files together, if you get an area where um, in one file there's an area you focus, the next one it's not, and for some reason it chooses that area that's out of focus for the, the uh, composite file, 
you can go in and actually use that brush to take out that part that's out of focus and, and, and put in the part that's, that's in focus. This is stuff that we will do in Photoshop, um, but what Helicon can do in a matter of minutes would take hours with Photoshop, so this is definitely worth it if um, you, might, you might run into that issue. There's also a 3D model export, so your static images can be used to create a 3D model it's not as exciting as it sounds, you really get sort of a, <laughs> instead of a sphere, you get more of a, um, a dome with it. Um, but it, it, it can be cool. And then there's also a batch mode to process multiple image stacks. And um, if you wanted to do the same image stack with other parameters, you can use that as well. Um, this is a photography setup from our malacology department. They're also doing a type imaging project. Um, they're using this rig to do um, very small shells, a couple of millimeters in length. Um, so this is a Nikon V90 um, with an Infinity K2SC long distance microscope lens on it. Um, and it's on a motorized copy stand that was modified to use the stack shot control box. So they're doing the, the process where you set a bottom and a top and it just does it automatically. As far as pricing for, for the software goes and the equipment, it's, it's actually not too bad. Um, an unlimited license of light is under fifteen dollars. Um, that includes updates, and then Pro is um, two hundred. Um, the the Stackshot Macro Rail package is about um, five twenty five, and then you're looking at another forty five to eighty for shutter cable. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the editing techniques that we use in Photoshop. And for the type imaging process, Mark mentioned that you know we, we don't mess with those photos well. I mess with them a little bit. Um, <laughs> It's, it's very minimal um, editing, and that editing that we do is trying to make that specimen look true to the specimen that you photographed. So taking out any, any of the distortion that might have happened with, with the photography process. And being that I've photographed thousands of specimens in the years that I've been at the Academy, I'm pretty good at telling um, what they look like without having the specimen in front of me. Um, so just a quick run through of the, the steps that we go through. Um, I typically adjust the image size, levels adjustment, scale, add a scale bar, crop the image, um, do some work to the background, remove artifacts, um, do a sharpen, and then save the files. And I'll just try to run through this quickly. And this, I'll, I'll be running into this um, in more detail in the, in the workshop later on. Um, so, uh, for image size adjustment, when the file gets exported out of Helicon, you get file with a resolution of 72 dpi, but the canvas size is gigantic. Um, what we want to do is adjust that so that we have a decent resolution that would be suitable for um, publishing these if um, you end up um, publishing that or if you get a request for someone who wants to use it. <coughs> um, so typically what I'll do is I'll change the resolution to 600, and then you always write down the, the pixel dimensions. So once you change this, you can then change the pixel dimensions and that will automatically adjust your canvas size. Um, so that we've just got a more manageable file as far as the size of the canvas goes. It's still the same pixels. You haven't changed the, the, the data at all. It's just in a more manageable size as far as looking at it on the screen. Um, and then for levels adjustment, again, this is also very minor. Typically, what we end up doing is moving the shadows over into where the histogram is going to start off. And then the same thing with the highlights. It's not always appropriate to move it all the way over. You have to kind of get a feel for that. And then uh, adjusting the midtones just to, to get it to look like it should um, if you're actually working on the specimen. Um, for adding the scale bar, um, I'm just going to go through the steps really quickly. You may have to rotate your scale bar a little bit if it's a little skewed, uh, but you just cut that out and then um, rotate it that way. Uh, create a new, new line using the pen tool. You can't see it. <laughs> but I typically put a point to this side of the scale and to that side. And if you hold in shift, it draws you a perfectly straight line. Um, you can see here, you can see that path there. And then you stroke that path, um, you, you typically using the brush. Um, and then I use the marquee tool. And again, you can't see it, but I drew a box inside that white line. Um, and I'm going to cut it along these lines, basically just cutting off that end. So now you, get, you have a nice straight line with no rounded ends. Add some text in there, and then you've got your scale. 
Now the important thing with this is to make sure that you are adding that bar and the text on separate layers, um, because that way you can take that and actually move it around. You don't have to worry about um, having it affixed to where you, where you made the scale. And then for cropping, um, typically for that, you want to leave some space around the specimen, um, but you don't want to leave too much, because again, then you're increasing your canvas size, which makes your file bigger and takes up more space on your server. So leaving some space, but not so much that. That is excess. And cropping, you get so what you end up looking like, what it ends up looking like. Now, when you're doing the background, um, I typically use a graphics tablet um, for, for a few reasons. If you're using a mouse, um, it doesn't feel natural as you're trying to, trying to draw in here. Also, if you have to get into little tiny areas, it's going to be difficult because you've got to keep changing your brush size. With a graphics tablet, um, they're pressure sensitive. So if you want to get into an area that's really thin, you just don't press as hard. Um, and the same if you've got an area that you need to fill in, you can press harder and it'll fill that in. Um, you've got a couple options with graphics tablets. I found the Wacom typically work the best, but they have a degree of ranges of sophistication and size. Uh, the entry level is sort of the, the bamboo model. Um, or $80, um, so if, if you don't end up using it, it's not that much of, a, of an investment. But then if you get into the Intuos models, um, they have these additional buttons on the sides which you can set for